Okay, uh, let's get started. What, the class is getting smaller every day. Is there an exam today? Just tired. Um, I shouldn't ask you because you're here. So um, uh, before we start talking about uh, our topic for today, uh, just a reminder, so I promised to get you proposals graded by today. I've gotten about a third of them done, um, so I'll have them done definitely by tomorrow. Um, some of them I'm already marking that need a revision. Um, you'll have a sort of note in your grade book about that, so I will be sending emails out for those folks that I think there needs to be some changes to the proposal. That's the whole purpose of the proposal, so don't freak out if it says that you need a revision. That's part of the process. Um, but uh, uh, in some cases, there's sort of just little issues that need to be fixed before you go ahead with your project. So um, again, don't like dive in and write your paper tomorrow, which I don't think is going to be a problem. But except maybe for you, Ivana, you know, turn your homework in for <laughs> um, but uh, wait until you, we, I sort of talk to you about the projects if, if there's a revision note in your, in your grade book. Um, homework 6 is now online. This can be due next Monday. Uh, just looking ahead, the next homework assignment is probably going to be due on the follow, not, not Friday of this week, but the following Friday because that Monday is a holiday, so I'm going to get us back to the Friday schedule. So just so you know that's coming, you're going to have a little bit of break on the homeworks. Um, now, the other thing next week, um, as part of the other class that I'm teaching, uh, we have several events that are related to life in the universe and astrobiology. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the quarter, uh, there's opportunities for extra credit for these things. And so the next one is coming up uh, next week on Friday uh, in the Soyce Room of the Main Library. This is a movie called uh, Woman, The Woman in the Moon. This is an early uh, silent, fi a silent film. It's actually a German film, but that's fine because it's silent, so it doesn't matter what language it's in. That's the beauty of silent, silent films. Um, uh, but there's actually going to be a live uh, band that's playing music to sort of go along with the silent films. So if you ever watch silent films, you sometimes hear music. There's actually a live band playing. Yes? Um, the 21st is Thursday. Oh, um, OK. Let me double check exactly what the date is. It may be, it may be Thursday. I think the number is right, so if it's Thursday. Yeah, because today's the Thursday's fourth day. Okay, I'm totally off on my time scale. So. Okay, so yes, probably it'll be Thursday, but I'll I'll confirm that. Yes. Contact one. Can we still watch them and like our own? Uh, well, sex credit is an extra thing. Uh, it is part of being at the event. So, um, so yeah, you could watch Contact now, but but we had to event for it. Um, there'll be at least. I think one or two more after this, extra credit signs after this. So, um, but yeah, I mean, trying to make this one, it's, I mean, the part of it is sort of being there and having a discussion about it as well. So, because I, I think it's not like every movie for extra credit, you don't have to actually be in the class. Yes? Is there a limit to how many extra credit assignments you can do? Or can so, my usual. Um, policy, and I, hopefully this is written up in the notes, is that uh, you can get up to 5% of extra credit. Um, so if you do like 10 extra credit assignments, only five of them will count. Um, although they're also graded for the writing, so like if you do 10 and they're sort of half as good, then that will still count as 5%. Um, but we only have five extra credit assignments, so there's going to be no limit for this class because we're, we're already at sort of the minimum threshold anyway. So. Any other questions? All right. Um, OK, so uh, today we're going to hear uh, two talks on news uh, that's out in the universe. Um, Melissa's going to talk about exoplanets, very habitable worlds. And Derek is going to talk about Antarctica's blood falls, which I never knew about, so that's going to be kind of cool. Um, here's some papers that have these behind you. Um, go ahead and just leave your stuff. So, Melissa, you want to come up? <coughs> Hi guys, I'm Melissa, and my article that I chose is called Astronomers Join Forces to Speed Discovery of Habitable Worlds. And basically this article was talking about UC Berkeley's like um, research to try to find um, like exoplanets that have kind of like same characteristics as like the the planets like in our own solar system, both gas and rocky. And their research um, like, um, project 
It's called Nexus for Exoplanet System, N-E-X-S-S for short. And then basically what they're like researching is that they want to use like three different techniques to try to like closely analyze their characteristics more better. And then like um, like one technique they're using was the Gemini Planet Imager or GPI for short. And so far, um, like their professor Marcy, like their astronomy professor so far, he found the first known 100 exoplanets using the GPI technique. And basically that technique like images um, kind of like that, like the exoplanet using like their um, their light, kind of like um, kind of like to see like their um, infrared glow. And that kind of characterizes the planets um, like to see closely like what heat they give, they give off and like the organisms that could possibly either. And I think there was like another article last week that talked about that too. And then um, they also um, like they also the exoplanets are like they're like little planets that orbit other stars kind of like how our planets orbit the, orbit the sun. And they're like inside a planetary disk with debris. And that kind of like goes hand in hand with like the solar nebula hypothesis. But how like that states with like our solar system, it came about that way. How like it was first contacted like that, and then it kind of expanded into this. And that kind of like goes hand in hand with that. That's why they want to like closely analyze these planets to see if like there's any kind of like power on it. And then they kind of want to combine that technique with two other ones, like the transit method and the Doppler technique. And basically those two techniques together, they like, they try to find the, do the Doppler shift, I think this is called? Doppler mm -hmm. shift. And then um, that basically like tries to analyze the frequency and like the, it thinks of the wavelength. I'm not sure exactly what it said it was, but it was kind of like kind of trying to like find the, the relationship between the planet and like the parent star. And then also, um, it tries to look into the the radial velocity, and that's that picture. That's kind of like how they want to see how the planet like orbits around the radius, and how like when it goes in front of the star, <clears throat> the star gets dimmer, which is why the line gets lower. And they try to like they try to like look at those two characteristics to see if like. Um, it is kind of like the same as our planets, like how we orbit the sun and everything. And basically, um, with the GPI, they're able to detect faint infrared glow. Um, like right now, they're only to detect. They're only able to detect that with hot Jupiter-sized planets. But they're hoping with like together with those techniques, they could find it with like other planets, not just like the the really hot big ones. And then. So yeah, so far they were able to find a um, hundred uh, exoplanets so far, and they're trying to find like um, ones that are like more that are farther than the ones close by us. And we they think that using these three techniques together, that we're able to find like um, some sort of signature of life, either from their infrared glow or from like their habitable um, environments. Any questions? Two questions. Always the first two questions are hard. Go ahead. Yes, please. Um, for the quote that you said, the professor said like reflected, reflected light. So mm -hmm. is it does he does he or she mean like as like so whatever the planet has like a reflected light, there's gonna be like, yeah like light. um. Yeah, like how he was basically saying with like the GPI, you could detect the kind of heat it gives off, or it can also mean like there's some type of organisms kind of like that give off that um, like light. Or like he said either that or like the planet could have like a type of energy 
kind of like the same as habitable like planets here that give off that kind of heat. Well, okay, so, <laughs> so let's correct a couple things. So we don't, we give off light, we get infrared light because of our temperature, but if you actually take a picture of the Earth, what you'd see is mostly just the warm Earth, because the Earth is the same temperature as we are. So we don't, we, we as being all life on Earth, give off some radiation, but we're also swamped by the radiation just from the ground. Um, but reflected light refers to light reflected from the sun or the star, off the planet back into our eyes. And when we look out in the planets, that's what we're looking at with our visible light, you know, with our eyes. We don't see the emission from the planet in our eyes because it's too long frequency, right? We only see things in infrared light. Sorry, other way around. We only see things in visible light. Plants are emitting in infrared light. So reflected light is reflected light from the sun off the atmosphere or off the surface back into our eyes. And we talked, uh, we spent some time at the beginning of the quarter talking about light and spectroscopy. So how do we figure out what kind of elements are present in the atmosphere of a planet, for example? Well, if you are, what elements are in the atmosphere of uh, Venus, for example? How do we do that? Way back in the second week of the quarter. Maybe the third. What's the technique of separating out the light to see if you're at what's what's absorbing the light in that well that's that's the thermal emission well that's that's just what i said no. <laughs> what is the technique in which you can measure the absorption and emission just spectroscopy, spectroscopy. Right. Remember the spectroscopy? We talked about how you separate the light with a prism or with a grating. You can see how the light pattern changes with wavelength and frequencies. So those patterns from atoms and from molecules are very specific. And so if you look at the spectrum of a planet, you can see what kind of molecules, for example, are in the atmosphere. What's a molecule we have in the Earth's atmosphere, which is a real clear indicator that there's life here on Earth? So what other plants have carbon dioxide in their atmosphere? Oh, more Yeah. Is it nitrogen? Carbon? I think it's carbon. Well, is carbon a gas in our atmosphere? I hope not. Carbon's like graphite. Graphite gas would suck. Literally. <laughs> What'd you say? Oxygen, right? Is there any oxygen in the atmospheres of Mars or Venus? No, right? That's produced by photosynthetic plants here on the planet. That's a direct consequence of life here on the planet. So we can look for oxygen absorbing in the atmospheres of these planets by spectroscopy. And that would be light reflected off the atmosphere and absorbed at certain wavelengths and then you see the sort of future oxygen. That's what they're talking about when they're looking for signatures of life. It's not life itself giving off special lights. It's just the chemicals that are associated with life. Uh, okay, another question. That was one. Long answer. Yes, sir. So on your slide it says can only detect optically earth size planets. Yeah. Can, so that means earth size it's not really different. Yeah, it was, yeah, I think the one, like, the one thing I talked about was that it was difficult to get um, kind of like Earth-sized rocky planets. And it, it only talked about GPI, how they tested that on large detectable planets because of their, like, okay. that's why they're trying to see if using all three would make it. So part of the problem is, you know, uh, something that's big has more emitting area, so it's going to be brighter. And in this case, GPI is looking for the thermal, the black body emission uh, from these planets. So a big planet's just got more area to emit light, so you can detect it. When you shrink that down, Earth-sized planet, it's just not as much light. So that's the limit of the technology today. Um, and I think Melissa's, you know, described that 
by combining that with other techniques, it may be possible to get down to those smaller planets. But mostly we're just looking by technology. Okay, thank you, Melissa. All right, uh, next, Derek. And please remember to write down some notes for Melissa uh, for uh, improving or keeping things that worked really well. What worked, what can be improved? All right, so Derek's going to talk about something I've never heard before. So I, I've heard about this place one time, uh, and I looked it up, and I heard about it. Yeah. So today I'm Derek, and I'm going to talk about a study, recent study that was done to look for the source of the blood falls. So for those who don't know, blood falls is located in uh, the dry valleys of Antarctica, which is known as being extremely dry and extremely cold. Uh, the only source of water there are some isolated lakes and uh, frozen glaciers. One of those glaciers is called the Taylor Glacier, and as you see in the picture, that's where blood falls seeps out of. It's not really a waterfall; it's kind of disappointing, but it's more of a it's more just seeps out, uh, seeps out of the base of the uh, the glacier. Uh, the reason it's that color is it's actually very salty, uh, iron-rich water that is oxidized and. Uh, Gives off that color. It's caused by microbial life in within the water, and so this test actually went to look for the source of that. Um, what they actually did was pretty cool. They put an electromagnetic sensor on the uh, helicopter there. They called it Sky Ten, but it's basically sending electromagnetic. You can't really see the device, but it's attached to a helicopter. Yeah, it's right here. Uh, it basically what it does is it sends electromagnetic electromagnetic waves in order to get a reading on the composition under the ground. So Pretty similar to how they find the composition of stars, and we'll talk about that lab one time about looking for oil. Uh, what they actually discovered was pretty interesting. They found that underneath the surface, there's a connection of uh, briny water that uh, all underneath the surface that houses like the microbial life. And uh, how this kind of relates to this class is that recently NASA's come out with reports that there's evidence that brine exists may exist on Mars. I'm not sure if they said. I know that they believe there's evidence for Brian, and uh, just finding, even though Mars is uh, a couple steps up in the hostility of the environment, finding a uh, finding a place on Earth that's cold and dry that still houses life gives a lot of hope for finding life in the brine of Mars, and even extending that out to something like Europa or maybe Jovian Okay. And, uh, actually, on this slide is. Uh, you can actually see some of those renderings and the 3D renderings, yeah. And, uh, okay. Any questions about Antarctica's blood falls? Um, I might have missed it, but what is brine? Brine is like extremely uh, salty water, somewhere, oh. but like a degree up, I guess. Like how salty? I don't know, sure. I don't know the number either. It's like the formation of after water evaporates. I think it leaves behind salt that's inside of it. Yeah, there, there's brine on Mars, but no, there's no light. There's no light. Day at least. Day. <laughs> Please. Um, is it only coming out from like. Yeah, yeah, it comes out of the, they call it the snout, which is like the, the lowest part of the glacier. So that's the only part that comes out of it. How long has it been like that? I don't know. Uh, as long as they've seen it, I guess. Any other questions? Okay. Great. Thank you, Derek. Okay. So, um, so that's actually it's very relevant to what we've talked about today, which is looking at uh, life in sort of uh, icy places, dry icy places, or at least as far as you know, dry icy places. Um, today we're going to be sort of moving out our search for life. Oh yes, and please make sure you give some notes for Derek as well before, you, before we move on. Um, we're going to be extending our search out for life. This this uh, yesterday or sorry, Tuesday we talked about the habitable worlds in the inner part of the solar system and why those might be valuable places for life forms because of the presence of liquid water. Uh, today we're going to go out to the outer solar system because there is in fact water out there, um, but in ice form. But it may not all be in ice form. Um, so just remember that, you know, we talked about the habitable zone as this sort of ring around the sun where the temperature, based on the amount of light that's coming from the sun, 
uh, is warm enough so that you have liquid water. Not too warm so that all that water turns to steam and not too cold so that it turns to ice, all right? So the gold is just right. Um, now, that might be if, if the edges of the Havel zone are a little fuzzy because it will depend a little bit on what the properties of the atmosphere are, whether the greenhouse gas effect, how much greenhouse gas effect you have. And that's part of the reason why uh, there's sort of this, uh, we believe there's sort of this evolution between what we think were three waterly worlds. We know, we've seen evidence that there used to be water on Venus. We can see that in the basaltic uh, residues uh, on Venus. Uh, there's lots of evidence that Mars at some point in the past had water. We can see all of the sort of flow patterns and the minerals that form in the presence of water. But today, of course, we have Venus as a hot, dry world, Mars is a cold, dry world, and Earth is the only one that's retained its surface water. We talk about several reasons why that is in terms of the evolution of the planets, in, the, in terms of the evolution of the sun itself, how the sun has gotten brighter and moved the habitable zone out. And that's made left Venus much, much too hot for, for life. Um, but that's just half the solar system. So what about these worlds out here? Right? They're definitely outside the habitable zone. Right? The habitable zone sort of stops somewhere around Mars. All these, these planets are much too cold. But as we'll see, there may be ways in which you can have liquid water, not on the surface, but perhaps on the interiors of, of the moons around these planets. Um, so I'm going to talk first a little bit about the planets themselves. So, you know, we've talked about sort of the, the masses, the radii, the densities of the inner planets, so it's worthwhile sort of looking at how that compares to these giant uh, gaseous outer planets. Um, here are just some of the statistics. Jupiter, of course, is our largest planet in our solar system, uh, both in terms of mass and radius. Uh, you hopefully, maybe you remember or don't remember, the, uh, the radius of the Earth is something like 6 times 10 to the 3 kilometers, about 6,000 uh, 6, kilometers. So Jupiter is about 100 times bigger than the Earth, right? It's a much, much bigger planet. Um, and the mass, of course, is much, much bigger as well. But the density overall is actually quite low, right? When you, when you calculate out the density, you get something that's actually closer to the density of water. And as I mentioned on Tuesday, uh, that's not because Jupiter is made out of water, but it's because Jupiter is made out of a gas that can be very low density at the top and very, very high density at the bottom. And then the average is somewhere around uh, one and a third uh, grams per cubic centimeter. Right? Uh, and all these planets have about the same density, which are very, very low. Uh, Saturn, in fact, is so low that it has a density that's lighter, less than water. So again, if you put Saturn in the middle of some great cosmic ocean, you could actually watch it bob up and down. If you want. Uh, we don't have that, but that's fancy. Uh, so, uh, so these are, you know, these are sort of the outer parts of, the, of our solar system. They're huge planets. A lot of mass is contained in these systems. Um, but it turns out most of that mass is not in the same elements that we have here in our terrestrial worlds, right? So we're made of mostly uh, things like silicon and oxygen, rocks and metals. But this is the composition, the elemental composition of the sun and of these outer four planets. And you can see that they're a lot more like the sun, mostly hydrogen and helium, than planets like the Earth, right? Earth has essentially none or very little hydrogen or helium uh, in its interior. Right? Almost all of that has sort of been evaporated off or baked off. Some of it is still contained in the rocks or contained in sort of the, or particularly the organic species. I mean, we're, we have tons of hydrogen in our bodies, right? one of the most important elements in life. But in terms of the total mass, hydrogen is a very, very small component of the Earth's system. Whereas Jupiter and, and Saturn, right, 90%, 96% right, for Saturn, most of this planet is just the lightest element that's in the universe, the most common element. Uh, and then a very little bit of sometimes kind of small, small amounts of carbon oxygen, at least in the sun, a little bit of methane, but very little of anything else other than hydrogen, helium, these objects. They're very, very different bodies than, than our terrestrial worlds. And again, going back to this idea of the solar nebula hypothesis, there probably is some rock out there, but there's just much less rock in the universe, right? There's much less iron, there's much, much silicon in the universe. So these plants were able to acquire all this very abundant gas, in part because of their large size. Now, what are they like on the inside? Um, well, they are, again, they're mostly made of hydrogen, so it turns out that their insides are mostly different forms of hydrogen. So you have sort of the surface, which is sort of the visible clouds, but as you continue on, you're just getting into denser and denser and denser forms of hydrogen, because that's mostly what they're made out of. Uh, and of course, the outer layers are gas, hydrogen, like you normally see hydrogen here on the Earth, but at a really high pressures, and they can get up to 10 million times atmospheric pressure at the centers of these planets. At these really high pressures, Hydrogen starts to behave very, very funny, right? Instead of being a sort of free-flowing gas, it becomes more of like a liquid, a 
a liquid substance, a high pressure liquid substance. Now remember, we talked about liquids being very important for life as a solvent, as a medium for which stuff can flow around. So you think, well, well, great, there's a ton of liquid inside Jupiter in the form of hydrogen. Unfortunately, it's also in a form which is being mixed very rapidly by the sort of heat escaping from Jupiter. So it's a little bit too turbulent of a fluid in order to have life forms. And it's also at extremely high pressure, much higher pressures than we see here uh, on the Earth. So if you can crush hydrogen down into a liquid, it's likely that any other carbon compound is also going to be crushed. And so you can't have the chemistry that would normally give rise to life. And then the very inside, the very cores of these, uh, you have sort of an outer layer of what's called metallic hydrogen. Again, a very unusual form of hydrogen, which we don't here have, have here on Earth. It's crushed to the point where it kind of makes this semi-solid thing that's a conductive medium. Now, we have a conductive medium in the inside of our planet, which is what element? Iron. Iron. Yeah, we have an iron core. Why is it important that we have an iron core? What does that help you produce? Thank you. You're paying attention. Good job. All right. Copy. Or you already <laughs> copied it. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right, everyone gets coffee in the morning. Um, so uh, that iron in the insides of our planet, which we know is there because of the density of our planet, it's so high that it must have some metals in it. We also know from, uh, from uh, earthquakes and seismo seismography that we can tell that there's a liquid in inside core of iron. That is the conductive material that as it spins around creates this large magnetosphere around the Earth. These planets have another conductive material, metallic hydrogen. And not surprisingly, they also have very strong magnetic fields. Right? So this is just an illustration of Jupiter's magnetic field. Uh, just for comparison, this is what the Earth's magnetic field looks like in, in size. Jupiter's magnetic field uh, is at least 100 times larger. In fact, it's the largest structure in the solar system, which is kind of weird to say that a magnetosphere is a structure, but if you, if you bend your brain a little bit, magnetic fields as things. This is the largest thing inside our solar system. Um, in fact, if you could see it, it would actually be much bigger than the full moon, even out here. Uh, and it, just like the Earth, it protects Jupiter from much of the solar wind. And it also gives rise to aurorae, as we'll see in just a moment. So that magnetic field is a direct consequence of the interior composition of, of Jupiter. And in fact, all of the planets which have this metallic hydrogen or some kind of very high pressure metallic substance in their cores also give rise to magnetic fields. Yes, sir? This is probably a stupid question, but are magnetic fields spherical? Uh, no, uh, so, okay. So it is, it's actually not a stupid question. It's a very good question. Um, so magnetic fields, uh, the thing about magnetic fields is that they're always, you always have poles for magnetic fields, right? A magnet always has a north and a south pole. Um, whereas charge, which is this sort of other part of the electromagnetic force, electro is the electric part of the force, is based on points of charge, right? You can have something that's a charge, negative charge, or positive charge. So uh, the field, because it has these poles, the most simple field has a dipole structure where you have a field line that goes from the north to the south. So it's kind of um, maybe in the shape of a seed or something like that more than a, than a sphere. That's the simplest form. In fact, and, and it turns out that you know Jupiter, uh, Saturn, the Earth, the Sun have mostly dipole fields. But you can also have sort of stray magnetic fields that form other shapes. And in particular, when we look at the Sun, you see lots of structure in the magnetic field that's not spherical. And that gives rise to magnetic recombination, solar wind, coronal mass ejection, all sorts of really phenomenal activity from the non-symmetric aspects of the magnetic field. But the, you know, for the most part, for we'll talk about in this class, is most magnetic fields have this sort of dipole structure because there's two poles, north and south. And the field lines go from the north down to the south. Now, uh, with the Sun and Earth and, and Jupiter and Saturn, that, that dipole is basically aligned with the rotation axis, which kind of makes sense. If it's the rotation of this fluid that's driving this magnetic field, you'd expect the field to be aligned with that rotation. But uh, when we look at Uranus and Neptune, a couple of weird things. First of all, uh, Uranus' uh, field is not actually in the middle. It's not aligned in the middle. You can trace magnetic field lines and see that they go to a place that's not actually in the middle of the planet. It's kind of off to some side inside the planet. And it's also, this is the rotation axis for Uranus. It's tilted on its side. And this is a magnetic field. It's 
off-axis. Now, our Earth, North Pole, and South Pole are also slightly off-axis, but only by maybe 10 degrees or something like that. This is about 60 degrees. It's like tilted all the way on its side. <coughs> we don't quite understand how this magnetic field sort of has, you know, has arisen, why it has this structure, what's actually causing the dynamo process that raises this magnetic field. But it must be something much more complicated than we see in the Earth and Jupiter because of this unusual geometry. But nevertheless, the presence of these big planetary magnetic fields points to the fact that there must be some liquid or some kind of metallic substance on the inside that's able to actually generate these fields as it, as it moves around. Okay? And uh, you know, again, another manifestation of these fields that we see on the Earth is aurora, and we see aurora on giant planets as well. This is a picture of Saturn uh, taking an invisible band, and also this is sort of UV light here. And you can see these sort of auroral spots, very similar to what we see on Earth, but of course, like 100 times bigger, because this planet is 100 times bigger. And these aurora can persist for much, much longer time scales. You know, if you go up to the, you know, near the north or south poles, you can watch the aurora sort of come and go on sort of minute to hour time scales. These things can last for several days. Right? So there's obviously a lot more energy contained in these fields than there is for the Earth. Right? That's partly why these aurora are so persistent. Um, okay, so let's see here. Now, Melissa was talking about the thermal emission from planets. Uh, these planets also are, are sort of large enough that they have some thermal emission. So if you look in the infrared, you can actually see uh, that the light emerging for, for example, the deep interior for Saturn is about as much power as is coming out from reflection from the sun's reflection off the surface of the atmosphere. Remember, that reflection is how we see the planets. Right? We only see essentially a mirror of the sun when we look at the planets. But if you actually add up all of the energy across all wavelengths, half of it is this reflection, and half of it is the thermal emission from deep inside the planet. Now, if it's creating heat, right? if it's creating this thermal emission, where does that heat energy come from? Where does it come from in our, in our planet? Yeah, but where and what's what's actually in the inside causing the generation of heat? What's causing it? Mm -hmm. The electromagnetic. No. <laughs> the so electromagnetic force carries radiation, oh, but so let's we'll say again, radioactive, radioactive yeah. K, right? That's the source of heat <clears throat> in our planet, right? It's a direct conversion of mass to energy through radioactivity, through through fission, um, and that's the source of heat in our planet. Now, these planets, you know, that's because we have metals in the interior of our planet. These planets are mostly made of hydrogen. Hydrogen does not decay. It has nothing to decay into, right? It's not a radioactive element. Right, just say regular hydrogen, is a, there's other forms. Um, so what is generating this heat? Um, any ideas? What are the ways you can generate heat inside a planet? What's that? Yes, and we'll talk about that, um, but generally, so this is going to get a little head, but we'll talk about how the moons around these planets are heated by tidal forces. Uh, and that's partly because the moons are so much smaller than the planet. But uh, the amount of energy that's going back into the planet, so the energy is probably about the same, but it's covering a much bigger mass. So the amount of heating just from that tidal interaction is probably not, not enough. It's definitely not enough. We'll come to tidal heating as a, a energy source. It's going to head a little bit. It's not, high, they're not tidal heating. What else causes the insides of planets to get warm? Is it radiation? Radiation is. Okay, so you know one possibility is that it's just light from the sun, right? Heat from the sun. But as I said, half of the radiation we see from the planets is from reflection. That's just bouncing off, and that's just at the surface. Not a lot is getting into the interior. In fact, part of the reason it can't heat up the interior is because you can't see into the interior. If you could see into the interior, then the radiation can get in and heat it. But since the atmosphere is opaque, none of that light's actually coming in. So it can't be sunlight coming in and heating up the interior. It'd have to be transparent planet, which would be cool, but it's not that one's heat. Yeah. Is it hydrogen fission or fusion? So that's a good possibility because we have lots of hydrogen. But what do you need in order for hydrogen fusion to take place? Um, 
true in what form? What form? That's not an energy source. That's a form. That's a state of matter. But what causes matter to become a plasma? Uh, ionization. True. And what do you need for ionization? A lot of electrons. Um, you, well, you get the electrons from ionization, but how do you how do you make those electrons move um, away from the atoms? Yeah. Yeah. High temperature and pressure. High temperature and pressure, thank you, yeah. So really high temperatures, you need to excite those electrons so much that they pop right off, right? Now, the insides of these planets are hot. They're maybe 50, 100,000 Kelvin, uh, which is pretty darn hot. It's enough to ionize those, those atoms. But ionization is actually a much lower energy scale than actually merging the nuclei of things together. In order to merge the nuclei of hydrogen atoms in the sun, you need a temperature that's in the 10, you know, 3 to 10 million Kelvin. Right? Much, much higher temperature. And that's true for most stars. You're sort of up in the sort of several million Kelvin in order to get enough energy to sort of slam these protons together so that they fuse. So these guys are not hot enough for hydrogen fusion. So while you've got the fuel, you don't have the conditions for, for that particular reaction. What else? Yeah. Differentiation. Differentiation. So what do you mean by that? Just uh, material. So hydrogen goes out, and mm -hmm. and then you said to what about helium? Yeah, the the, the little like, metals that there are goes down to the water. Okay, so um, is differentiation happening here on the Earth right now? Who says yes? Who says no? Who says maybe? <laughs> maybe is actually probably a better answer. There's a little differentiation happening on the Earth right now, uh, but the Earth is already fairly differentiated, right? All the metals in the middle and all the rocks on the outside. So there's not much more you can sort of squeeze in. But the Earth is a pretty small planet, and part of your homework assignment this week is to look at the time scales of that sort of differentiation process. Jupiter and Saturn are pretty darn big planets, so would you expect the differentiation time scales to take longer or shorter amount of time? Longer. Much longer. Right? So, so Saturn and Jupiter and some degree Uranus and Neptune are still separating out their materials. So differentiation is actually it's the only actually energy source that we have left over, which is gravity. And gravity sorting out the heavy and, and light stuff. And so we think particularly in Saturn case, much of the heat that's being produced from Saturn is is what we call helium rain. The helium is very slowly settling down to the center of the planet. The hydrogen is getting pushed outward, but that doesn't change that much. And as those elements come down, they jiggle other stuff, right? They sort of knock each other around. Those knocking efforts, you know, produce heat, and that heat is eventually radiated off the side. So these outer planets, so while the inner planets are, are powered by radioactivity from the metals in their interiors, these outer planets, which are mostly gas, are still <coughs> differentiating. They're still settling. And that settling is producing the heat that we see in the infrared from these planets. So th those processes can still occur in very, very large planets. OK. So uh, I showed this picture of, of Saturn's aurora. Another interesting aspect, of course, of Saturn is its great ring system. All right, here's a nice, uh, surprisingly real picture. This is not a fake drawing. This is actually a real picture of what Saturn looks like from uh, behind. The sun is sort of on the other side of Saturn. So you see a couple things. You see the light sort of uh, refracting around the edge of the atmosphere. And you also see the light refracting around the ring system. And so you can see the rings very, very well because we've blocked out the sunlight by the planet. And Saturn has a very complicated ring structure where there are several sort of different named rings out here. Uh, this outer one is the E ring. Uh, this is the A ring in here, the B ring here, the thin C ring, or maybe that's a D ring. Um, it's lots of sort of structure in this ring system. Now, where do those come from? Well, those are, uh, I should say, these, are, these rings are first seen back by Galileo in 1610. This is one of the sort of key pieces of evidence that he cited as why the, the Earth couldn't be the center of the universe, because we see material that's sort of around these perfectly spherical bodies, right? They're not perfectly spherical. They have some structure to them. He could very barely make out Saturn's rings with his telescope, but he could clearly see that there was something around Saturn. Uh, and, of course, there was also the planets as well. Um, uh, and what they're made out of is actually very, very small pieces of rock and ice 
uh, you know, sort of scales of maybe up to 10 meters, uh, sorry, micrometers up to 10 meters, so really big things, but also very, very tiny rocks, that tiny sort of fine dust is extremely reflective, right? If you've ever, like, sort of snapped, you know, like the, you know, like, we used to use chalk, but real, real chalk, and you'd, like, smack those erasers back, and this cloud of dust would come up, right? You can see that cloud of dust because those little particles are very reflective. This is the same reason the rings are so brilliant, is that they're just mostly made out of a lot of very fine reflective material that's reflecting sunlight back then. Now, Saturn is not the only one to have rings. In fact, all of the uh, giant planets have some kind of ring systems. Saturn's is certainly the most uh, dynamic, uh, but you can certainly see small rings around Neptune uh, and Uranus. Jupiter has a very, very thin ring, which is really only visible in the infrared. And all of these things are being produced by the moons, the many moons that are orbiting these planets, that are orbiting around these planets, as they're sort of ground down over time. The material that's coming off these moons is actually feeding these ring systems, and we'll see a really good example with Enceladus for Saturn in just a little bit. Um, now, the other thing I should mention is that these ring systems, we can dynamically sort of calculate how long they're supposed to live. Um, they should only be around for an order of sort of tens to hundreds of thousands of years, which sounds like a long time for us. But in fact, that's a very short time in terms of sort of the planetary evolution time scale. So these things have to be continually maintained, or they would eventually disappear. So you know, today we see Saturn with this really gorgeous, beautiful ring, but if we went back a million years, we might not see anything that's unusual about Saturn, right? We happen to live in a time when Saturn has a great ring. Lucky like, yes. But these are part of the uh, features of all giant planets. Yes? Is there like a reason why Saturn's rings are really, um, like, cleaner? Um, it's, part, it's We'll talk a little bit about at least what's being part of it, but it may just be that Saturn has more small moons around it that are being ground down right now. Um, uh, it's possible that Jupiter, I mean, probably very early on, Jupiter probably have a spectacular ring system, but all that material sort of all disappeared. When it gets down to very small grains, eventually they just fall down onto the planet and they get sort of cleared out that way. So Jupiter may have had a really big ring system in the past, distant distant past, but it probably just all ground down and they don't have any. It's taken a longer time for Saturn to do that, just because it's a smaller mass planet. And these guys have fewer moons. They're also lower mass planets, so they're not pulling apart the moons as much. Uh, and the material that makes up these rings is also darker. It has sort of a, a sort of higher, a lower albedo on its surface, and so we can't see them as well. And that has to do with actually what those moons are made out of. Yes? Um, the force that makes the root stay in Saturn typically, or is like the gravity, or well, what makes them uh, stay in the shape of the? Well, so it's uh, so it's the same thing that keeps our moon in a sort of orbit that's relatively circular. It's gravity pulling down while the particles move in the opposite okay. direction. So you have the sort of force pointing this way, velocity going this way, and it constantly sort of changes direction. So these are literally millions or billions of little tiny moons that are in orbit around the same time. And if they were a little bit above or a little bit below, I should, this is what I think, these rings are incredibly thin, right? This extent is maybe uh, 300 kilometers or something like that, which seems pretty large. But this planet is, you know, 100 times wider than the Earth, and the rings are another factor of two or three beyond that. So this is like one of the sharpest things in the universe, even though it's 300 kilometers thick, right? It's a very, very wide, but very narrow passage. And part of that is if you have stuff that's sort of above or below this ring plane system, it tends to get sort of uh, sort of scattered around by the rings and then sucked down at the planet very quickly. So you have this kind of competitive process where the stuff that's right in the plane is survived. We'll see another reason why those rings will be in that plane in just a moment as well. Is there another question? Yeah. Um, would exoplanets have ring system as well? So that's people believe that that's possible. So there are groups looking for rings around around exoplanet systems. Okay. All right. So, um, so again, as I mentioned, these rings are are fed by the sort of small moons around these systems, and unlike the terrestrial planets, these planets have tremendous number of moons. Um, this is probably already out of date because we keep finding more little tiny moons around these planets. Um, but when I made this slide, we had about sixty six moons around Jupiter. Uh, I'm naming some of the big ones here that we'll talk about in just a minute. So most of these are very tiny little rocks, right? Oblong little sort of you know, rocks of ice and stuff like that. Uh, Saturn is about 62 of them, and even Uranus and Neptune, which are further out, have lots and lots and lots of different moons. Right? Um, 
including a nicely named moon for UCSD and Neptune, which we'll talk about in just a minute. All right, but these there, there's a wide variety of the ma of masses and sizes of these moons, composition. Some are made of mostly rock, some are made of mostly ice, some are a mixture of these two things. Um, and they have some very unusual patterns to them, as we'll talk about in just a moment. So here's just another picture of at least some of the biggest moons around these planets. Okay, so here's here's the Earth, here's our moon. Mars has these tiny little dinky little asteroid things that don't really have anything. There are some asteroids that have little moons. You can't even see them on this picture. But here are these Jovian moons, which are, at least in the case of Ganymede, even bigger than our moon. Like, even Ganymede is actually even bigger than Mercury, the planet. Right? So these are little worlds unto themselves. Right? Here are some of Saturn's biggest moons. You can see this very large moon called Titan, which we'll talk about in just a minute. It looks a little fuzzy. We'll see why. Uh, again, here's Uranus. Here's Neptune with its very large moon. So uh, there's tons and tons of moons out there that are, are sort of all individual little worlds. A lot more terrestrial worlds are actually outside the terrestrial planet zone than there are inside the terrestrial planet zone. So this is another reason why we're interested in these little places as well. So, uh, and Jupiter at least, the sort of four largest moons, and these are the moons that you could see when you did the night lab, or we talked about them when we looked up at Jupiter. All right, these are the moons that Galileo saw back in 1610, that he tracked over the course of several nights and could see that they were orbiting around Jupiter. Right? You can measure those rotation, or those orbital periods. And again, it put this sort of uh, nail in the coffin for the geocentric model because here were worlds that were orbiting something other than the Earth. Right? So it didn't make sense the Earth could be orbiting something other than itself. So that, that turned out to be the sun. Right? So, but these are all, you can see just from the pictures, these are all very, very different moons. And uh, th just like the planets in the solar system, they show some very unusual patterns. So again, you saw something like this when we looked at and, and with these telescope, you know, one of the things hopefully you've noticed was that they're all in the same line, right? If we go back today, they'll be in a different order, but they'll still be in the same line. Um, there's also a pattern in terms of how the densities change. So the density of Io, which is the closest moon here, is the highest density, average density, about 3.55, just about that of, of Mars, it turns out. And then the densities get smaller as you move away from Jupiter. Have we seen this pattern before of densities getting smaller as you move away from something? All the planets, yes, have that same pattern, right? So it's a little off because Earth actually has the highest densities, and that's not the closest planet, but the terrestrial planets have very high densities, five, you know, like Mercury, Venus, and Earth are around five grams cubic centimeter. Mars is around three and a half. These giant planets are around one, so there's a decrease in density as we move away from the Sun. We see the same kind of thing as we move away from Jupiter, a decrease in density uh, as you go further and further out, all right? and this sort of constant plane thing. So when you combine that and you also look at the ring system is also in the sort of same plane as these moons, uh, we have the idea that it's essentially the same patterns that we see in the solar system. So we think that these moon systems form very much in the same way as our solar system did, just kind of on a different scale, all right? As opposed to forming around the sun, these little moon things formed around Jupiter, but they formed out of a disk, right? And that disk was actually aligned with the disk of our planetary system, the protoplanetary disk of our system, because in fact the line in which these moons are orbiting, the plane in which these moons are orbiting, is the same plane in which the planets are orbiting, right? It's essentially the same material. It just got caught up around Jupiter <coughs> or Saturn or Neptune as opposed to around the whole sun. So this stellar, solar nebular idea has sort of different scales as it moves down. <clears throat> okay, so um, so I want to dive into some of these moons because, again, the purpose of this class is look at what are the possible possibilities of life uh, on these outer worlds. And to do that, we have to kind of look at these worlds in greater detail. So this is Ganymede. This is the largest moon uh, in the solar system. And as I mentioned, it's bigger than Mercury. And it has a lot of the same uh, geological processes that we see in the terrestrial worlds, right? Uh, so what do we see? Uh, so you can just kind of tell that this, this planet is not uniformly colored, so there must be some kind of process that's sort of shifting things around. If we zoom in at sort of the boundary between these things, um, we can see that, uh, for example, this sort of dark stuff over here uh, is very rough, has lots of little craters in it, uh, whereas this sort of light material here uh, has very few craters. There's a couple uh, that show up here, but otherwise this is a very smooth surface. Where else have we seen very smooth surfaces, at least in terms of terrestrial planets? What gives rise to those smooth surfaces? Isn't it 
volcanism? That's it. So volcanism, right? So on Mars, we have volcanism. On Earth, we have volcanism. On Venus, we have tons of volcanism. And on these planets, you have very smooth, sort of mostly unmarked territories. Even on the moon, the mare on the moon, the sort of dark spots on the moon, are fairly low crater because they've been paved over by volcanic eruptions. So this indicates that there's at least been some kind of tectonic activity, some kind of volcanic activity that's actually kind of paved over the surface of this planet sometime in the past because it gets rid of some of these, um, these craters here. Right? So evidence of tectonic activity uh, in these moons, that's one of the things that we know is important for at least life on Earth. Um, here's another moon around Jupiter. This is Io, and this is probably the most sort of like psychedelically colored planet that we have in the, in the solar system. Um, all of these sort of patches you see here, these dark patches, you probably know by now, are volcanoes. Um, Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. And I've talked about sort of most in terms of volcanoes in the past. Uh, which planet has the largest volcano? Mars. Mars. That's Olympus Mons. Which planet has the most volcanoes? Venus. Venus, right. Io doesn't have the most, but it is constantly in eruption, all right? All of these little patches, and you can, I mean, these are some really beautiful pictures that have been taken by Voyager and Cassini space, uh, sorry, Voyager and the Galileo spacecraft. Um, you can see uh, what looks just like kind of lava just popping out of the surface. Uh, you see sort of all these sort of basalt flows. You see gases and jets going off the side. Um, this is con happening continuously. And you can even see this uh, in uh, both the thermal emissions, and this is an infrared image showing a very hot spot in, in Io. And associated, you can see this, literally this eruption of material that's spewing material out into space. All right, these are huge eruptions. I mean, imagine this is happening on the Earth, a volcano that was actually emitting stuff in the space. We'd be, in, we'd be toast. Um, here's actually a nice little movie of this uh, from the Galileo, sorry, from the New Horizons spacecraft. Uh, remember, new, well, we mentioned New Horizons before. This is a spacecraft that's going out to Pluto. <laughs> But in order to get out to Pluto, it had to swing by Saturn for a gravity sort of boost. And as it went by, it took some photos of stuff, uh, uh, sorry, around Jupiter. Uh, and it took this sort of movie of material erupting off Io. Again, if this was happening on Earth, we'd be, we'd be in trouble, right? And that's probably why Io is not likely to be a place where you actually find life forms, right? It's much too unstable, right? Volcanism was really important to bring an atmosphere to the Earth, but constant volcanism is not a good idea. Now, Io's been around for a while, right? Four and a half billion years. It's not a particularly big world, right? If we go back to the sort of comparison of planets, right? Here's Io, here's the Earth. The Earth is not in constant volcanic activity, right? Why is Io so active? So small. Well, so Mars is smaller than the Earth. Is Mars volcanically active? Why, 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 does, why does size matter for the terrestrial planets in terms of tectonic activity? What, what, really, what killed Mars's tectonic activity? Why is Mar we know Mars was active in the past. Why is it not active now? It yes, sir. Yeah, it ran out of heat, right? The heat source of, of Mars and, and terrestrial planets is radioactivity. And radioactivity decays over time, right? Those elements decay, and then they're gone. And so if you have this process of decays over time and you have less of it, eventually you don't produce enough heat and you freeze out. That's what happened to Mars. Io is smaller than that. And also Io's density is about the same as Mars, so it probably doesn't have as many metals in it. It's probably even fewer metals than Mars. So radioactivity is probably not a source of heating for Io because of, because of the patterns that we see in the inner solar system. What's another possible heating process? those of you who have read ahead or read the slide. Thank you. <laughs> all right, yeah, tidal stretching, all right, right there, tidal stretching. What do, what do I mean by tidal stretching? So as Jupiter goes, it's Io, sorry, Io goes around Jupiter, Io's orbit is actually slightly eccentric, and we'll see why that is in just a moment. But Jupiter is this massive planet, and it exerts a really tremendous gravitational force on Io. And more importantly, it exerts a force that changes as you go across Io's surface. So a point that's closest to Jupiter is being pulled a little bit harder than the point that's further away from Jupiter. And you end up with sort of 
not quite this extreme, but a little bit of an egg-shaped IO. It gets stretched a little bit. That's what happens over here. When it comes back over here, the gravitational force is not as strong, and so that stretching decreases and relaxes. Now, if you ever took like a credit card or something like that, and you bend it back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, what happens to it? Anybody want to donate their credit cards? Yeah. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, anytime you bend something to the point of where it can like start to break, you do that back and forth, back and forth, right? Next time you have an old credit card, try this out. It gets hot, right? You're producing friction by rubbing the sort of interior materials of, of this credit card back and forth. The same thing can happen on a planetary time scale. As this thing gets squeezed and squished, squeezed and squished, squeezed and squished, as it changes shape repeatedly over the course of, of days, because that's how long it takes around the orbit, it's heating up, right? And it's constantly heating up, right? This is a process that just keeps going. It's not like radioactivity that decays over time. This is still squeezing, squeezing, squeezing back and forth, right? I should say that the same process happened with our moon as well, right? The moon is in a tidal, it's being tidally locked by, it's being tidally affected by Earth, right? We're also being tidally affected by the moon. But because the Earth is so much bigger than the moon, that effect has been to squeeze the moon back and forth. And we can see the evidence of that squeezing in the volcanic flows that we see on the surface of the moon. The moon has very little radioactive material in it, certainly today. But it seems that not too distant past, there was massive volcanic eruptions. And it's probably from the internal heating that happened through this tidal, tidal squeezing. So this is the process that happens in many, many moons around solar systems. Now, it happens a lot for Io because of this eccentric orbit. Yes, ma'am? Um, so would it break? Um, Io probably wouldn't. Other moons can. And in fact, that's when I talk about how those moons, the little moons around Saturn, feed the, the ring system. So those little moons are also being tidally squeezed, but they're so small that as they do that, they literally lose, lose material. Right? Either the heating sort of produces jets, or they can literally start to break apart just from tidal forces. And that's the stuff that ends up in the rings. Io is too massive of a moon. It's got enough gravity to keep everything together but it's still getting kind of squished. So it produces heat, but it doesn't necessarily break apart. If Io got closer to Jupiter, that's a possibility. And then you'd have a huge ring system, that'd be awesome. Right? But that's probably not gonna happen in our own time. Um, but it does produce a lot of heat. So, uh, so this measurement, heat per gram, all right? Uh, that's a good measure of how much energy is available for things like tectonic activity. And uh, you know, you can estimate how much radioactive material is inside the Earth. You can generate and estimate how much heat. You can divide that by the mass of the Earth. You get some measurement of the heat energy produced per gram of material. Io is 200 times what we get here on Earth. So it's not surprising that it's far more volcanically active than the Earth is. Continuously volcanically active. And continuously because this tidal squeezing is not going away. Right? It's constantly replenished. Now, most of the time when you have a situation like this, that squeezing also causes you to lose energy in the orbit, so you eventually circularize. That's what's happened to our sun, or, or sorry, our moon. Our moon is not being volcanically active today because it's circularized. It's not getting squished in different amounts as it goes around its orbit. But Io's in kind of a funny situation because it's not alone. It's also got these other moons around it, all right? The other two big ones near are Ganymede and are Europa. So Io, Europa, Ganymede are the three moons kind of moving out from, from Jupiter. And they're in something what we call orbital resonances. And so they actually orbit in such a way that they will line up at certain uh, sort of integer numbers of orbits. Right? So you can see that there's a lineup right there. And we can wait a little while and there'll be another lineup between these two, right there. All right? Every time they get close to each other, they start to interact gravitationally with each other. Right? Not just with Jupiter, but also between the moons. And those little interactions are enough to kind of tug at those orbits and keep them out of a perfectly circular pattern. Right? So the interaction between the moons and the tidal interaction of Jupiter with the moon is enough to cause uh, Io, and as we'll see the other moons, to have a this sort of extra internal heating source, which is tidal stretching. Literally the squeezing and squishing of the moon itself to generate heat ultimately coming from gravity, but it's a complicated dance that actually makes that happen. Is there any questions? Okay. All right. So, so, that's, so that's happening at Io, and Io's getting so much of this squeezing that it's simply, you know, 
way too energetic, way too much energy interior to have life. Let's move out to see what's happening with this planet, Europa, or sorry, this moon, Europa. So this is what Europa looks like on the outside. It doesn't show the same kind of volcanic activity, like constant eruptions that we see in Io, but it does have a very unusual surface, right? Uh, this is all ice along the surface, right? You do have some occasional sort of large crater impacts that you see down here. But for the most part, this surface is actually relatively crater-free. So it again suggests that there's some kind of tectonic process that's going on to keep the, the surface very smooth and wipe away those craters that are happening on the Earth. Now we know that Europa has water. In fact, uh, because it's down the outer solar system, there's lots of ice in that area, and it's been able to gather ice just being around Jupiter. It turns out that Europa has, in fact, more water contained in its, its total ice interior uh, than, you, than the Earth does have uh, water on its surface. Right? That has a lot to do with just the way that where water got into the inner solar system. There wasn't a lot of water at the beginning of the solar system in the inner solar system because it was evaporated, so it flew out as gas. Most of the water we have on Earth probably came to us from either asteroids or just some stuff that got left over that was sort of contained in rocks when the Earth formed in the first place. But Europa is out in a place where ice is a solid, and you can build things out of ice. And so many of these worlds actually have a lot more water on them than, than Earth does, even though they're much, much smaller bodies. So plenty of water on them. Uh, going back to the surface, this is a close-up of the surface taken by the Galileo spacecraft. And you can see that there aren't any craters, but there are certainly lots of unusual sort of what looks like kind of glacier patterns. You can even see some kind of sinuous stuff here that almost looks like it might be kind of river uh, sort of uh, features and stuff like that. Um, the, there's essentially very little atmosphere for Europa, so there can't really be much in the way of sort of liquid water on the surface because it evaporates immediately. But it does look like that water makes it out every once in a while. And there's a lot of activity here that seems to be caused from some kind of tectonic forces, stretching and pulling, um, as opposed to kind of a stable surface that doesn't do anything. So again, we think that all of the stretching and pulling is because of uh, sort of the tectonic forces that are driven by tidal forces. These cracks are literally like the cracks that we see at the bottom of the mid-Atlantic ridge, where material is coming out through these tectonic plates. You can almost think of that all these little, little sections are dozens and dozens of small tectonic plates that are sort of moving around and colliding with each other, building up temporary mountain ranges and stuff like that as they move around. Very, very similar kind of geology that we have on Earth. It's just with a different material. Instead of rock, it's ice. But it's still kind of the same kind of sort of tectonic plate activity. And because of that, we, we think that the tidal heating is enough because there's so much movement. Uh, we know there's movement uh, on our crust because of the semi-liquid mantle underneath the crust. Right? That allows the crust to move around. Europa must have some kind of semi-liquid thing underneath it as well to keep the stuff moving around. And the only th the material that's made up of, of Europa is mostly water, or mostly of ice. And so that semi-liquid material of ice is, in fact, liquid water. And so there's lots of evidence based on the ge geology and the tectonic processes and the fact that we know it's being tidally heated to suggest there's probably a very large and per perhaps very deep ocean of liquid water under the surface of Europa that's, again, heated by the sort of tidal heating force, right? This is potentially warm water, liquid water, uh, that's making up a large section of this, of this interior of the moon. Now, we don't know this picture for sure, because we'd have to actually drill down to sort of find uh, these oceans. And that's uh, sort of missions that NASA is sort of contemplating right now. Uh, but that would be a very exciting place, because we don't know of any other place in the solar system, in fact, really nowhere else in the, in the universe, that has a deep ocean of water other than the Earth. Of course, we think that life on Earth really originated in those oceans, and so that might be a good place to look for life. Okay. Okay, moving out, uh, this is the moon Titan uh, around Saturn. And this moon looks a little funny. It looks like uh, whoever took a picture of it uh, got to focus the camera. Um, but, of course, it doesn't actually have to do with anything in the focus. This is exactly what we look at if we look at Venus, because what we're looking at is a very, very thick atmosphere. This is a moon that actually has an atmosphere that's thicker than the Earth's moon, or the Earth's atmosphere. And it's an unusual atmosphere because it's made out of uh, not sort of the carbon dioxide and nitrogen and oxygen that we see here on Earth, but the carbon dioxide we see mostly on Mars and, and Venus, 
but it's mostly nitrogen, but also argon, methane, and ethane. All right, these are complex carbohydrates. Now, why isn't there any CO2 in Titan's atmosphere? What happened to the carbon dioxide? Yes, sir. You used to form all those complex. Um, it, it could, yeah, and there, there's certainly carbon and methane and ethane, um, and there's oxygen, so there, there's probably part of that uh, in the chemical reactions. But, you know, you, we have methane in the atmosphere here, and we also have carbon dioxide, so we don't actually have to get rid of all the carbon dioxide to make those things. Why wouldn't we have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of this moon that's out at the orbital distance of Saturn? So there... There, that's a question. We don't actually know about the volcanic state of, of Titan. Um, so I'm going to punt on that. <laughs> and there's, a, there's actually a much more basic chemical reason why there's no carbon dioxide in Titan, even if you could supply it. What happens to the carbon dioxide on Mars every winter? It freezes where? Yeah. We have these sort of cycles of poles on Mars when the carbon dioxide from the air literally condenses out of the air and makes ice. Now that's Mars, which is about you know one and a half astronomical units from the sun. Saturn is out at somewhere, actually, I think nine AU or something like that away from the sun. Is it warmer or colder on Titan? Say it loud and proud, man. Colder. Colder, yes. It's heck a lot colder, all right? So the surface temperature of, of Titan is probably something around uh, sort of minus 90 degrees Celsius or something like that. It's a frigid planet. At those temperatures, carbon dioxide is a solid. It's not in the atmosphere because it's, it's a solid. In fact, it's a solid rock, as we'll see when we look at sort of the surface of, of, of uh, Titan in just a moment. Now, um, back in 2004, I mentioned there's a spacecraft called Cassini that went out to, to, uh, to Saturn. Uh, it was launched in 97 and re arrived in Saturn in 2004. It's been out there since then. It's still orbiting around Saturn, still taking pictures. Um, you can see some really beautiful movies of Saturn from the Cassini spacecraft. Uh, it also had a probe that was launched to specifically to study Titan because we were very curious what's under this atmosphere. Anything by an atmosphere, you get really excited about what's happening underneath it. So it launched a probe that landed in 2005. Uh, and not only did it discover that there was atmosphere of, of methane, it also discovered that there's actually liquid on the surface of Titan as well. So uh, again, here's a picture of Titan from the outside. And if we look at a wavelength where we can actually see through the atmosphere, if we look through the infrared, here's the kind of first picture we start to see of the surface. And it's a little hard to make out in this picture, but there's a lot of structure. And well, let's turn off the lights so you can see a little bit better. Look at these right here. What do those look like? Like islands. Like what? I was going to say islands. Like islands? So in fact, they're the opposite. What's the opposite of an sea. island in the sea? Oh, it's, it's, it's a lake. It's a lake in the land, yeah. right? These are, these are liquid lakes. And they're not liquid lakes of water. They're liquid lakes of, of hydrocarbons. All right, so here's another close-up picture. This is actually pictures from the Huygens spacecraft that I was landing. So this is looking at your at, at Titan from afar. This is as it's coming in, all right? And there's all these sort of unusual features that it was seen as it's coming in. And this is actually landed on the surface. Now it landed in a dry spot, which is actually a good thing, because if it landed in one of these car hydrocarbon lakes, it probably would have sunk and it wouldn't have been that great. Um, but notice the surface here. There's all these sort of rocky things. What are those rocky things made out of? CO2 and water, all right? The rocks of these outer moons are ice, just like they were the things that built the planet, the moons in the first place. That's the solid substance that are out there. So we have a really bizarre kind of system, right? I mean, there's some kind of soil that's around here, but much of this stuff uh, is actually ice. And that's the sort of solid substances. Now, here's a radar image taken by Huygens uh, uh, as it was arriving. And you can really start to see a lot of these sort of dark reflective patches are liquid surfaces, right? When we take radar pictures of the Earth, the oceans are black because they don't reflect back radar, radar light. We see the same thing when we take pictures of, of uh, Titan. 
Um, now, just to drive this home, here are two pictures. One is of Earth and one is of Titan. Who says the top one is Earth? Who says the top one is Titan? Who has no idea because they look identical? Yeah. So it helps to have a little color, actually. So let me put some color in. Now it's not clear, right? This is Chesapeake Bay, and this is the surface of Titan. Same size, all right? Same scale here of features, all right? And same kind of sort of fluid features as we see on, on Earth. So this is the only other world in the solar system that has a liquid on its surface. And many of its sort of basic geological properties look very similar to, to our Earth, just in a completely different temperature zone, right? And with completely different materials, right? We have water. These are hydrocarbons. This is literally kind of like liquid gas, right? That's just floating around. But liquid gas is a, is a substance that has carbon and oxygen and hydrogen. These are basic building blocks of life. And so there's still a lot of interest in Titan because you know the Huygens ladder didn't have anything to test to see if there was life and no, no little bugs crawled up and said hi or anything like that. Um, but you know this has a lot of the elements that we think life needs to have, a liquid solvent, the chemicals you need for life. Um, the only problem is it's very cold, so maybe there's not enough energy around. But of course, we see life forms on the planet that live in extremely cold environments as well. So this may be some form of life we haven't actually seen before. Um, another planet, a moon around uh, Saturn, which is interesting, is Enceladus. Uh, it's a tiny little world, all right? It's not much bigger than Britain. Um, but the interesting thing we see from Enceladus is this material that's being blasted out from its interior. These are geysers. Um, and in fact, these geysers are actually feeding the E-ring system of Saturn. So here is the E-ring, and here is Enceladus. And this material that's going off in cell is actually forming this ring. So we see a direct connection between the ring system and the moons in this case. Now, uh, as there have been some of, uh, we've already had a news report on, on sort of this, uh, these geysers before, but we know that there's water and salts and organic material that's going out of this geyser debris. Um, if you have liquid water, or at least you know, sort of steam water coming out of the interior, there must be some sort of liquid uh, in, in, inside. And again, the process that's creating this is the tidal stretching of Enceladus from Saturn. So again, you have all of the necessary ingredients, energy, liquid water, and organic material. So Enceladus is another place where life may be uh, possible and may have already formed. Um, all right, last but not least, there's Triton, which is out by Neptune. This is a huge moon, all right, one of the biggest moons in the solar system. It just happened to also named after our mascot. All right, and um, it also has a really unusual surface structure that we think is related to tectonic activity. So uh, we have sort of these funny names like panel of terrain because it has sort of patchy space. There's frost deposits, right? Frost happens here on Earth because water condenses out of the atmosphere. So if there's frost happening on the surface of this, of this moon, that's really interesting. And even more interesting, there seems to be sort of evidence of weathering features that we haven't seen on any of these other moons except for Titan, which has a big atmosphere. So the thought is that perhaps uh, uh, Triton has enough uh, sort of uh, tidal heating uh, that it's actually sort of produced a small atmosphere, and that small atmosphere is actually having its effect on the surface of, of the planet. And so again, we have a source of energy. This thing is mostly made out of ice, and it may even have a little bit of an atmosphere at the surface, although probably not enough to support a lot of life. Um, so a lot of interesting aspects of Triton as well. So we have plenty of worlds out beyond the, 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 the sort of habitable zone uh, that are around these gas giant planets. And many of these worlds have all the sort of elements you think you need for life, right? Energy from tidal heating, liquid water, all right? Titan has an atmosphere, it has liquid on its surface. All right, all these places are really uh, fascinating places that may have potential for life. And of course, there's a lot more of them than there are in the inner solar system. So as we start to talk about other possible places for life out of the universe, we're going to come back to this idea that there's sort of two kind of places that we really want to look at, not just the terrestrial Earth-like worlds, but these moons around giant planets may actually be important sources for life as well. And as particular, we'll see that some of these giant planets around their stars are actually close enough to the sun where you don't even need the tidal heat. You can just get direct insulation from the star itself. Okay, any questions on this? Okay. Uh, so don't, rem uh, don't forget to finish your homework for Monday, and I will have all the proposals uh, finished by tomorrow.
And I may ask to have a couple of you come in for office hours just to talk about or maybe we talk about after class. Okay. Have a good weekend. Yes, sir. I was in the homework yesterday and yeah. minus five.